You know, there's a lot of talk about things going on. There's a, there, is a, there is a stirring in the spirit. I mean, I've been able to feel this for quite a while, a deep stirring in the spirit. Something is about to happen. I don't know what, but there's something big about to happen in America. And for God's remnant church, the remnant church that has not forsaken the word of God, that has stood on the word of God, has endured persecution because of that, refuses to compromise, but prays for a lost nation. And there's about to be something big happening. And a lot of the prophets are saying that this, this solar eclipse in April the 8th could be the beginning of something. And I want to, I want to delve into that a little bit. And I want to talk about the role of the prophet in the church that's been lost largely when we abandoned the fivefold model of church government. I also want to talk about the signs of the heavens. A lot of people say, man, that's just like, that's like, that's like pagan. And no, it's scriptural, actually. So turn to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, starting at verse 14. And stand for the reading of the word, if you would. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I just ask you, Lord, help me to help them. Let them see what I saw. It's not about my skill as a teacher. It's about your anointing. And I just pray, God, just let them see what I saw. In Jesus' name, minister to us, Father. Minister to us, Father. In Jesus' name. Verse 14, Genesis 1, 14. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the night and the day. And let there be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And let them be for the lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light to the earth. And so it was. And then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And he made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light to the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God said it was good. So the evening and the morning were on the fourth day. May God is a blessing to read in the word. You may be seated. He also said in Amos chapter 3, verse 7, I'm just going to read that to you. In Amos chapter 3, in verse 7, he said, Surely the Lord does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. And a lion has roared, who will not fear? And the Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? Basically what tragically we've done is we have negated or neglected the office of prophet in the church. And it's done a lot of damage to our ability to discern exactly what God is doing. Because he speaks to his people through the prophets, still does, even in the New Testament. Genesis 1.14 talks about signs and seasons. God said there shall be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the, the, the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons for days and years. The Hebrew word for signs is ought, and it means a mark, a symbol, a signal of an event that communi communicates a supernatural event. By the way, I just want to say before I go any further, in this church two weeks ago, if you were here, we witnessed a supernatural event. Pete had a heart attack in this chair right here while we were doing our church service. We laid hands on him and prayed for him. Y'all were here. Some of you are not here. You were here. We laid hands on him. We prayed for him. Believed the word. Called the ambulance. The ambulance came. He wouldn't get in it. He decided he was going to hang on to the word of God. You, you think you've got faith? Wait till you start having symptoms of a heart attack and now your decision is get in the ambulance or hang on to the word of God. He decided he was going to hang on to the word of God. Sometimes you've got to get to the place in your life where it's either hang on to the word of God or end it. You're not going any further and you're going to stay and camp out on the word of God and you're not moving off of that. That's the church that's entering in this new era that we talked about. And before long, he starts feeling better. We took him back there. They did. They cleaned him up. I thought he was in the ambulance. I look up. The door's open. And him and the girls come in here. And he sits down in that chair and finishes the service. And now there he sits. Can we give God a witness in here? Come on, somebody. Amen. I said, Pete, are you healed in Jesus' name? He said, yes, but my eye vision needs more work. <laughs> so... Um, I have no doubt that God will take care of that too. I'm looking for a church that has faith to believe the word of God. 
We don't have time to fall off for philosophy. We don't have time for 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 for, for just dabbling in. We got to have faith. We got to show the community at large. We got to show the world what the power of faith is. I'll never forget that. As long as I live. And you think you've got faith too, but you lay hands on someone and you realize they're having a heart attack and your whole church is watching you and you go, Lord, this better work. Hallelujah. <laughs> fear can creep in. The minute you get a challenge like that in your life, fear will try to creep in immediately and get them to kill and steal your faith. But I just decided I was going to believe the God. God, you decided you were going to believe God and now we have a miracle who sits here the same chair, no, oh, he moved back one row, but he, he's, he's basically in the same place every Sunday, and I guess he will be until God calls him home, and I think that's awesome, amen. That's what the world needs to see. So signs are supernatural events or miracles as a sign from God, and the Hebrew word for seasons is moadim. It's the appointed times. That's what it means. Speak to the children. This is in Leviticus 23, 2. It says, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, the feast, and the word there is Moedim, of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to the holy convocations. These are my feasts. Not the Jews' feast. They're God's feast. And they're not feast in the sense that we think of feast. They are Moedim. They're appointed times of God. And there are certain times of the year that you have an appointment with God and you're to come and show up and he's to impart something to you. An appointed time is scheduled and governed by a lunar cycle. The Jewish calendar is based on the lunar cycle and it's an error to call it the Jewish calendar. It's not the Jewish calendar, it's God's calendar. God operates off of the lunar phases of the moon. And just as the feasts are not the Jews' feasts, they're God's feasts, they're my feasts. And his people are supposed to get together and observe them. Jesus loved the feast. He loved them. You know what I decided? If he loves them, I'm going to love them. And I didn't even understand what they were. And as I begin to do research, I go, he was crucified on Passover, resurrected on first fruits. The spirit came at Pentecost. He's coming back at Tabernacles. The church should be totally, totally immersed in the feast of God. They should be central to their None, listen to me now, for 300 years, the, the apostolic church celebrated Jesus' resurrection on Passover. For 300 years. And then the Roman church decided to change all that. The blood moons. So the lunar cycle that governs that calendar, Passover occurs on a full moon of a specific month, and the blood moons are always a sign of warfare to God's people when they occur in a lunar tetrad that falls precisely on the feast day. Joel chapter 2, verse 30 and 32. I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, the blood and fire and the pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood. Before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord, it shall come to pass. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it's you say, well, God, that's Old Testament. This is exactly what Peter quoted at Pentecost, on the day of Pentecost. He quoted this scripture out of Joel chapter 2. And there's no biblical record that there was a solar eclipse at Pentecost. But I think what Peter was trying to say was, when you see strange events, remember, there's a turbulence. God's moving. The Holy Ghost and the power of God is moving. And he says, all that call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from the judgment that's coming on the earth. I am shocked at the number of Christians when you ask them, what are you saved from? Well, I'm saved from myself. Yeah, but no, I mean bigger. You're saved from God's judgment. That's what you're saved from. And even though there's no record of there being a lunar, a, a, a biblical eclipse, I mean a solar eclipse, it's still the Bible, he says, I will turn the moon to blood, and he said the sun to darkness. That will be one of the signs. So we know that God uses the moon and the sun for signs. A blood moon is a lunar eclipse. It's just a refracting of the sun's light around it that gives it a red appearance. So when you read in the Bible about a blood moon, it's just talking about the appearance of the moon during a total lunar eclipse. And there are seven times in history that blood moons manifest precisely on Passover and then on the following Feast of Tabernacles in two consecutive years, precisely on those days, in two consecutive years. And they signal a conflict that's coming for God's people. And here are the dates. 162, 163 AD, 
coincided with the worst persecution of Jews and Christians in the history of the Roman Empire. Three million uh, of them perished. One third of the population of Jews and Christians perished during that persecution. It was signaled, God warned his people through a blood moon sign called the Lunar Tetrad. The second time it appeared in history was in 772 and 773, the Saxon Wars broke out. The third time was in 1493 and 1494, and it was the year that King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain expelled all the Jews and started the Spanish Inquisition, and a dude named Columbus, who was actually a Jew, but they didn't know that, took their ship and went to find a trade route to the West Indies, but he discovered America. And America became eventually the home of more Jews than any other country except Israel. More Jews in exile from persecutions have come to America than any other nation except for Israel. I think that's interesting. And then the fourth time it happened, this lunar tetrad on feast days, 1949 and 50, during the, it was the first Arab-Israeli war, independence, for independence just after Israel had become a nation, again for the first time in 2,000 years. It should be noted that even though Israel declared themselves a nation in 48, the first government uh, took office. Their government didn't take office until January 25th of 1949. God said there's a conflict coming. He was telling the Jews there's a conflict coming. And then the next one, the fifth one, 1967 and 68, coinciding with the Six-Day War in Israel when they were attacked by six Arab nations in a blitzkrieg attack, and they won the war in six days. That was in 67 and 68. That occurred on a blood moon sign. Then this one has been really hard for me to figure out. The sixth one, 2014 and 15, y'all remember it? We were in this church because we were observing Passover. We got to see that blood moon. You remember that blood moon that we saw the night of that Passover that had fallen and was the last of the lunar of the lunar tetrad, and it signaled that that, that conflict was coming. And in 2016, a guy with funny hair, looks orange, colored all the time, won an election that absolutely shocked the world. And there was a complete change in the politics of the United States of America. There was a disruptive change in the world's political situation. And America entered into what I call a civil conflict. There is a war going on in America. If you don't believe that, turn the TV on. And this began with a warning from God. You're going to be persecuted. The church is going to be persecuted. Stand your ground. Don't compromise. Do not compromise. Stand your ground. Stand on the word. I'm not into politics, but you've got to tell me, if you look back in 2013, and look at America today. Could you believe some of the things that you're seeing happening in our nation? Come on, somebody. Sometimes history is hard to judge when you're in the midst of it. But God signaled us that there was conflict coming. There's only going to be one more occurrence that they can predict that they, the next one, the seventh one, occurs in 2032 and 2033, and that's the 2000th anniversary of Christ's death and resurrection. The second millennial anniversary. Think you think big could happen then? God uses the sun, the sun and the moon to communicate to his people. He uses the moon to communicate to his people. He uses the sun to speak to the nations. These, there's a, they use a solar calendar. A solar eclipse has been in the past. <clears throat> I call to repentance to the lost, the Gohim, the Jews call them, the nations. So the, the moon communicates to God's people. The sun communicates to the rest of the world. When Christ was crucified, it says in Mark 15, 32, there was a darkness that fell on the land at noon, and it remained there until 3 o'clock. Now, was it a solar eclipse? I don't see how, because the, Christ was crucified on the Passover, and the Passover is a full moon, and a full moon cannot block the sun during that stage of its, of its cycle. So what would you say then, God, God was? It was a miracle. That's all I need to know is it was a miracle. I believe the biblical account that darkness fell and there was an earthquake that followed. As a sign to who? The lost. You need to repent. That's what that's a sign of. And then the second advent, when it comes, it says in Matthew, Jesus said, 
Matthew 24, 29, and also in Luke 21, 25. He said, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. There will be a sun at the end of the tribulation, and it will be a solar eclipse. And then the opening of the sixth seal in Revelation, I looked when he had opened the seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, and the moon became like blood. The sign of Jonah. Interesting. Jesus, I asked Jesus for a sign. The Pharisees did. And they said, give us a sign in the stars and in the heaven that you're Messiah. And Jesus responded in Matthew 16, 3 and 4. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you can't discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet of Jonah. And he left them and he departed. And we all have said for centuries now that he was talking about three days in the fish, three days in hell, and then coming out of that and being resurrected. But there are, there are Christian astronomers that believe that there was a solar eclipse in Nineveh. You know the story. Jonah said, I'm not going to Nineveh. They killed all the people, the 10 tribes of of, of, of Israel. They totally wiped them out, annihilated them, tortured them, killed them, treated them like Hamas treats Jews now. Then they built monuments all over this huge city, Nineveh, to celebrate the, the way they had defeated the Jews and the destruction they had done to them. And I'm not going there. They don't need forgiveness. I'm not going there. And, he, and God said, you go preach to them and preach repentance so they can be saved. And God said, and Jonah said, I'm not going to do it. And he ended up in the belly of the fish. You know the story. He was in there for three days, decided this wasn't good. Got puked up on the bank in Nineveh. Dusted himself off. He had to stink pretty bad, by the way. Dusted himself off and said, okay, well, I guess I'm going to do what God says to do. And here's what he says. The scripture says he went into Nineveh and he said, you have 40 days to repent or God is taking you out. And what happened? They got saved in masses, droves, 120,000 people in Nineveh. That's a huge city back then. They got saved like crazy, and Jonah was disturbed by that because he realized that God was going to forgive them. And there are a lot of scholars that believe there was a solar eclipse at that time, and they saw the solar eclipse, and they heard him teach the solar eclipse would be a sign to the world to repent. And they saw the solar eclipse, and there is evidence that there was a solar eclipse over Nineveh sometime 17, you know, 778 BC, somewhere about the time that Jonah would have died. I get that. What I don't find is any record of that in the Bible, and I would believe it. It would be easier for me to believe if the Bible had said there was a solar eclipse. But you get the idea. And, and so one of these experts says, when God said to the Pharisees, he said, you're going to get a sign, all right? It's going to be the sign of Jonah. And then when darkness fell, that was the sign. Amen. So, the sign of Jonah basically is still up for grabs, but I know Nineveh represents a city that was evil, that had turned from God, that, 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 that accepted God's uh, uh, forgiveness and repented in a powerful and a mighty way. The sign of Jonah. Jonah's message, you have 40 days and God's going to take you out. So that God uses the moon, he uses the sun to communicate to the nations and to his people of what he's about to do. And then you mix in that with the prophets. They're essential to the progress of the church. The fivefold offices of the church, he gave some to be Ephesians 4.11. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry to edify the body of Christ and to prepare them to be successful. And we've abandoned that form of government. The, the apostles concerned with order in the church. The prophet is concerned with the presence of God in the church. The evangelist is concerned with the crowds. The pastor is concerned with the sheep. And the teacher is concerned with the truth. And they're supposed to work together to keep the church on track. And so we substituted that with a man-made government. We decided we would make the church democratic. God's kingdom is not a democracy. There's no voting. When you get to heaven, he's not going to take a vote on things. He's not going to ask you to vote whether you like it or not or whether you think it's right or not. It's a theocracy. What does that mean? He runs it. He runs it. He makes the decisions. 
And in this kind of a government, when you have a five-fold government operating in a church like we do, there are things that come up that are scary as heck. And you know what me and Bill and Roger do? And we get a hold of Brother Jim. When Jim was here, we would all get together. We would pray. And God would tell us what he would want done. And he would give each of us the same answer. I know of no time when there's one of us where, no, that's not what God told me. That way we know that we're hearing from God. And we know what to do. That church, the office of prophet, is a powerful thing. <coughs> now, tell you, they'll tell you, you got to be careful with these prophets. I don't follow them, I'll be honest with you. Mandy does. I did, my, my daughter loves prophetic prophecy. And she follows them, and she sends me a YouTube clip that says, have you heard this? And the reason I don't follow them is there's so many crazies out there. They're crazy as a loon. Now, I mean, telling you, they are. But there's some that are absolutely bona fide prophets that you know uh, you can count on. And God never does anything, it says in Amos 3 7. It didn't say only for the Old Testament times. Surely the Lord does nothing in the Old Testament uh, unless he reveals it to the secret to his service the prophets. It's forever. Now, <clears throat> there was a big controversy uh, among some of the tribes of the church. I divide the church of Christ up into three tribes the word tribes, the spirit tribes, and the word spirit tribes. And that's a pretty good way to describe them. If you think about them, there's a lot of our brethren that are committed to the word and the word only, and they really don't want to get involved in the ministries of the Holy Spirit. They really think that the word, in fact, a lot of them think that when the word was canonized, that the Holy Spirit no longer did miracles. The problem they have, we have with that is there's several million miracles a year that are done around the world that are documented they have no explanation for. And the other problem they have with that is there's no place in the word where it says that's going to happen. So those are two things. But they're, they're our brothers, and I love them. And they love the word. And the word is what they're about. And then there's, they have, but they have a, they have a, I don't offend them, but they have, they have a, 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 they're forever studying the word, but failing to come to the understanding of it. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has to interpret the word for you. Amen. What did Jesus say? He said, when I leave, he'll come and he'll teach you all things and he'll remind you of the things that I told you. The Holy Spirit will make it make sense whenever I leave. You live your life interactively with the Holy Spirit, seeking him every day, allowing him to speak into your heart, him to begin to enlighten the word for you. Those are the word spirit tribes. So what do the word spirit tribes do? They, they teach the word. They believe the word. They're unequivocating on the word. They're unequivocating on the word. And they teach the word and they stand back and they let the Holy Spirit bear witness to the word that's taught. When we prayed for Pete, we declared Isaiah 53, 5, that by his stripes, Pete is healed. And we stood back and we let the Lord take over. That's how the word spirit tribes work. And then there's the spirit tribes and they're my brothers. I love them, you know, but they're wild as a march here. They have a zeal for God, the Bible says, but without understanding. I just want to see a move. They just want to see something wild happen. I mean, a lot of times God's in that. I'm not saying he's not, but my point is I don't think they're grounded enough in the word and that's just my opinion. So there you go. It's worth what you paid for but Mario Morello, there was a problem with some of these, these spirit tribes. Some of the prophets in there were just like Mario Morello, who's a wonderful evangelist and a very credible evangelist, uh, called them out last year. In 2 Peter 2, 1, 2, he quoted it. He said, but there are also false prophets among the people, even as they will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. A lot of people saw these crazy nuts and they go, prophets, huh? What a circus. And he called out some ministries that I really care about and believe in and said, you need to begin to decide who you want to let on your program and who not to. Because they're damaging the efforts of the body of Christ. So, so here's my test. Brother Jim, when Brother Jim was alive, I would call him and I would say, have you heard what Chuck Pierce said? No. I mean, never. He never heard. I said, man, how can you miss it, Brother Jim? He said, da 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 He goes, I go, what do you think of that? He go, we'll see. See, that's a good attitude. I learned that from him. We'll see. 
Here's what it says in Deuteronomy 18, 20 and 22. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, the Lord said, which I've not commanded him to speak, and who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. The penalty for false prophets, for false prophecy is death. And if you say in your heart, how are we to know that the word which the Lord is, if it's a word the Lord has spoken or not, here's the way. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken and the prophet has spoken it presumptuously and you shall not have any fear of him. Most people don't give it enough time though. You gotta give it some time and you gotta weigh it out. Anytime you get a prophetic word, when somebody walks up to you and says, I'm going to give you a prophetic word, you go ahead and take that prophetic word, but you put it up on a shelf. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 14 to weigh the word out. You put that up on a shelf and you pray about that most of the time. We misinterpret the prophetic word. A prophet will come give us a word and we think we know what that means. And guess what? We don't. So put it on a shelf and you weigh it out and you give it some time. And if it never comes to pass, then you don't have to believe anything that guy says. But here's what the Lord says in Matthew, I mean in Deuteronomy 18, 19. It shall be that whoever will not hear my words, however, which he speaks, the prophet speaks in my name, I'm going to require it of him. When God sends a prophet who's credible with a word to the church, God will not absolve you from the consequences of not heeding the word of that prophet if you choose to disregard it. This is a very serious thing. But you've got to know that you're listening to a prophet who's credible. I used to listen to Rick Joyner a lot. Anybody of you heard of Rick Joyner, Morningstar Ministries in South Carolina, one of the great ministries in America? I used to listen to him a lot. And then he came up with this crazy prophecy in 2014, September the 23rd of 2014. And I said, I'm done with that. That guy's a nut. And here was the prophetic word he brought in 2014, 2014 in September. Terrorists will flood across the southern border. Crazy nut. <laughs> Texas and the south, southwestern states would try to stem the tide, but to no avail. What a fool. The federal government, these are, I'm reading, I'm not, I haven't got time to show you the whole thing, but I'm going to give you the link for you to go watch it. And how many of you know, when they put it on YouTube, it has a timestamp on it. It tells you when it was posted on YouTube. This was posted September the 23rd of 2014. So I'm going to summarize it, and you go back and watch it. The federal government would be completely would completely abandon their responsibility to protect and defend the border. 2014. That terrorists that crossed were an epitome of evil, and they were not all ISIS. There were terrorists from every major terrorist group in the world that came across the border. And even though the primary their primary involvement was in the southwestern states. The whole nation became disgusted with the federal government's lack of response that they and so many that they some had decided that the government had allowed it intentionally. Crazy fool. <laughs> that lawlessness would abound in every state, not just Texas, but in every state, lawlessness would abound. That militias would begin to spring up. And I don't think we've seen this yet. We'll watch for this. He's been pretty accurate so far. That militias would spring up over the nation as communities endeavored to provide for their own security as local law enforcement became overwhelmed by the invasion and had a complete lack of cooperation on a federal level. And this one is when I decided, this fool, I can't watch any more of this. He's drunk. This last one, that the most effective resistance to the invasion would come through county sheriffs in the southwestern states. 2014. And I said, he's an idiot. That's how much discernment I have. But I'm going to tell you something. When a, when, a, when a prophet proves to you that he's accurate, God said, 
You better listen to him. Because if you don't, I'll require it of you. And Rick Joyner has a prophecy out by America. I'm not going to go there today because there's another one that I want to get to. But when I saw this picture, this, this, this picture right here, I saw that picture on the news and I go, that triggered it. I go, oh my God. And I started, I told Carol, I started digging, trying to find that. Thank God for you too. I started digging and digging and digging and I found that prophecy and I went back and listened to it again. I go, that's it. And it's all come to pass. Nearly all. So, one of the prophets saying then about what's about to happen right now, and I'm about to tell you, they're seeing rivers in the desert and roads in the wilderness. That's what they're seeing. They're seeing a big move of God. And it begins on April 8th with a solar eclipse. So I want to get back from the prophets to a minute to the solar eclipses. The solar eclipse, the second, this is the second of two solar eclipses coming up on April the 8th. And they're referred to as the American eclipses. I don't know why. The second one starts in Mexico. And I've heard all kinds of things. People say the red heifer is going to be born. They're going to rebuild the temple. I mean, it's just like crazy that they don't. So I don't listen to all that. I listen to the prophets that have demonstrated actors. Amen. And so <clears throat> this first eclipse August happened on August 21st, 2017, which was a jubilee year. And coincided very closely with Trump's decision to move the capital, the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem and recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital city. You know what? Everybody said that would cause a war. It didn't. And it came on shore in a city that brother, a town that Brother Richard's probably familiar with, Salem, Oregon. And it passed over the United States and it passed over several U.S. cities named Salem. Now the second one is happening April the 8th of this year, 2024, and it comes onto U.S. territory through the Southwest United States, and it crosses into the U.S. precisely over the port of Eagle Pass, Texas. And these two eclipses combined will pass over 33 cities in the U.S. whose name is Salem. And Salem in Hebrew means peace, and Jerusalem means city of peace. And the place where the two cross and come together in the center of the United States at a place called Carbondale, Illinois is a place called Little Egypt. I don't know why they call it Little Egypt. They have little pyramids built everywhere. It's a very bizarre kind of a place, but they call it Little Egypt. That's exactly where these pyramids, I mean these uh, two solar eclipses cross. The April 8th, uh, April 8th eclipse also will pass over and come near to, it'll pass directly over two cities named Nineveh. And it'll pass over five cities, close to five cities, very proximate, that are also named Nineveh. So we started with Salem. Peace. God says, I want to give you peace to America. And then the second eclipse passes through Nineveh. Judgment's coming. You get to pick either judgment or peace. Now it's interesting that right in the center of that, where they cross, in Little Egypt, in this place called Carbondale, there's actually a street. What's well, amazing what they can do with modern science, isn't it? There's a street in the middle of that, right where those two blue lines X. There's a street right there, and the name of the street is Salem. Well, is God in control or is he not? Does he use the sun and the moon to send the signs or does he not? He's proven beyond the shadow of a doubt. I think he's reaching out to America and he's trying to get us to see that we need to get our ducks lined up and we need to repent. Now, I want to, <clears throat> so that brings me to what are the prophets saying? I don't know. I know what one prophet is saying. I want to show it to you. In 2019, Brother Tony Kim, how many of you remember Brother Tony? One of the most prophetic guys I've ever been around. Brother Tony Kemp told me that there was a young man named Chris Reed that he had met, and he told me he was a prophet being raised up for America in these days. And that was pretty high praise coming from a great prophet like Tony. And he said to watch and listen, and he was an unknown. I'd never heard of him. But I began to see him more and more and more. And now he's become, and Rick Joyner, the guy that prophesied the crazy sheriff thing, 
has retired from Morningstar Ministries and he has set Chris Reed in over that ministry. And Chris Reed runs a school of prophets there in Morningstar Ministries. And he's been on television, I mean, on YouTube several times, been attacked. Uh, but here's what I'm here to tell you. He passes the Deuteronomy 18 test. I know of no word that Chris Reed has brought that has failed. I know of no one. And a man I tr truly respect, Tony Kemp, has high regard for him. And I see in him that he is the man of the hour, that God that, 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 that God has raised up for America in this, in this time. And so I, I think maybe what he has to say about the eclipse and whether it means anything to America is important. I want you to watch this video. Yesterday morning, I had a dream that I believe was very prophetic. Um, it was not one of those normal kind of dreams, and I want to submit it to you all to pray about it, to seek the Lord about it. I believe there's hope and redemption in it, but I believe it's a warning. You know, there are some things that we receive from the Lord that are conditional, that we can pray and it makes a difference or it minimizes the, the danger or the damage. I know some things are set in stone, but some things can be altered and changed by human behavior and prayer, such as often we talk about Hezekiah who received the prophetic word that wasn't wrong. Get your house in order, you're going to die. And he turned his face to the wall and repented. And 15 years was added to his life. Same with Jonah and Nineveh. By the time Jonah got his act together and got to Nineveh, uh, he was preaching. Judgment was coming, but that judgment was, was put off. And so I share this uh, dream to you today in the fear of the Lord. I've just given it a title to recognize it, the rebirth of America dream. I had an intense dream Saturday morning, March the 9th, 2024, that seemed prophetic about the eclipse in April 2024 that's being talked about, triggering an awakening that starts in April 2024 and lasts until July 2025, so over a year. I'm only sharing the dream, no more, no less. I was moving fast in time in the dream, starting in April 2024 with the eclipse that crossed over Texas, which people have been talking about. It seemed in this dream that Texas was pulled into this. At the same time, around April 2024, a conception, metaphorically, a conception happened at this time and coincided with this eclipse, leading to something serious happening in the nation before the elections in November 2024. Before the elections, something serious. This event caused absolute chaos and affected the elections in the U.S. in November 2024. It seemed like an epic October surprise and pandemonium ensued. In the dream, I knew that President Biden had fizzled out and they had tried hard to prop him up. But this event right before the election caused a major division of America right before and during the election time. It intensified the division already in the nation to a very scary and intense level. And then the dream shifted, and it was somehow I was in 1968, and I was given an old newspaper which said, quote, Assassination of two major leaders in the same year of the Chicago Convention, unquote. And I'm sure you know, you know this to be the case as well. Robert uh, Kennedy Sr., Bobby Kennedy, 
and Martin Luther King Jr., who were both killed in 1968, tragically. But what's also interesting about 1968, the Democratic Convention was in Chicago. And it's in Chicago in 2024. And I knew that that was significant, but through all of the painful chaos in the streets, the economy, and on the news, America had a huge awakening of awareness of evil and corruption going on in America. And it was like the vast majority of the nation on the other side of this said, we can never let this happen again. We can't. <clears throat> the dream ended, and at the end of the dream, it was July 2025. Now, for some reason, July the 11th was highlighted to me on the calendar. It seemed like most of the chaos ended in the nation, and things were starting to heal by July 2025. It had all started in the April-May 2024 time with the eclipse beginning, coinciding with a conception. And there were 40 weeks long of pregnancy with intense birth pains intensifying before the delivery. And then there were complications before the birth and after the birth. Since the conception happens in around April, nine months later would have the baby being, being born in January of 2025. Now what's interesting about that, that's also typically when the inauguration takes place. But this baby was born, uh, and, and, and the thing that happened right before the election was almost like it went into... Um, Braxton Hicks contractions. It seemed like the birthing time was then, but it was still very intense and felt very real. And it was like the baby wanted to come at that moment, but somehow it was delayed to not being born ahead of time as a premature baby um, before the election when this bad event happens and it held off until... January. So the birth, as I said, was in January 2025 and was placed in an incubator even after it was born for several months. The baby lived and it was a beautiful baby. And the dream ended by me seeing this baby wrapped in an American flag. And it was like in the maternity uh, ward. And you know how like they have babies laying in little beds with their name tags at the top. The name of the baby was America. And so I couldn't help believe it was the rebirth of America. And so <clears throat> I, I think what's important, you know, to share about that, just a summary. Um, I'm going to pull this summary up here. The dream seems to portray an awakening starting, starting in April 2024 with a significant shaking going on, starting then, coinciding with a, coinciding with a 40 week long painful and traumatic pregnancy. A traumatic event triggers chaos before the elections and the chaos lasted for several months. And the birth occurred in January of 2025, requiring care in the incubator at least until July 2025. The 1968 convention, which was chaotic, by the way, the Democratic convention in 1968 was very chaotic. It was very much a time like now. There was a lot of um, protests and just... Does anybody remember the... A convention of 1968 in Chicago. Yeah, well, it's scheduled to be in Chicago this year. 
And um, here's the part, and we need to pray about all of this. I, I, I think this is a, a warning and a call to the intercessors and to the people of God to take this serious. Because in the dream, referencing the 1968 Democratic Convention in Chicago, referencing knowing Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and of course, Bobby Kennedy were both killed. I felt that the warning was there seems to be an indication of a coming assassination attempt sometime during this 16 month process from April, 2024 till July, 2025. And so we don't want to see that happen to anybody. Um, but I feel that this is important to share and to put before the body of believers to pray into this to see if the Lord can, um, can intervene and help us and show us what to pray and how to pray. And if some of this can be lessened or prevented, um, and I believe the dream was significant. And so I think we are entering into a unique time in American history. Um, these next, starting in April, I mean, really now, but starting in April, there is a 16 month process or thereabouts that I believe is very integral to the restoration or the rebirthing uh, of this nation. So will you help me pray about this? Will you help me pray into this? Amen. So, you know, I don't show you these kinds of things very often in this church. And I have to feel deeply stirred to do it. I also have to have great confidence in the man to speak. I'm telling you, he's hearing from God. We're entering into a pivotal time in the history of America. And what will be the difference maker is if my people who are called by my name. Not the lost. Not the lost. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their sin, I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin and I will heal their land. I think that's what the Lord is trying to tell us is there are things that are about to happen in the prophet that we can pray against and I, blame, I pray they don't come to pass but I just don't think there's any way that... Uh, that it'll, it'll not happen if our church doesn't begin to pray. You know, <clears throat> the thing about uh, prophecy, and so many times what he said is correct, is, 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 is he said America's headed for a great awakening. And I think it's an awakening he's talking about of the level of evil that's in our, in our, in our system. But I think, it's a, I think it's a great spiritual awakening. I think America is headed for another move like we've seen in the other four great awakenings where you saw being like what John Wesley and Charles Spurgeon and D.L. Moody and, and, uh, and Dennis Bennett and, and, and William Seymour and all of these guys that, that led these big moves of God that had an effect not just on America but the whole world. How many of you believe that if America will get born again, it'll affect the rest of the world? You believe that? Yes. Amen. You want to ward off evil in the world. The first thing that has to happen is America's got to get saved. And I just believe that we have an opportunity here. Well, I, I like to, I really did feel strong emotion when he said the baby was wrapped in an American flag. And I go back to another prophetic word that we received in this ministry several years ago from Chuck Pierce out of Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. Don't remember the former things or consider the things of old. Behold, I'm about to do a new thing. Will you be able to perceive it? Because I'm about to make roads in the wilderness and a river in the desert. You know, that's a very disruptive thing. A river in the desert is a very disruptive thing. If you've ever seen a flood in the desert, you'll never forget it. But what I believe is, is God is calling us to pray and no longer, uh, you know, in, I know what he said. Sometimes you need to pray about what you need to be praying about. Ask the Lord to show you. Ask the Lord to show you what it is that you need to stand against. And I think you can start with deception. We begin to stand against deception. We begin to stand against evil schemes in the name of Jesus. But if the church won't pray, if the church can't, can't come together around this word and this sign from heaven, 
that God has provided us, Nineveh won't be saved. But I'm telling you, when the anointing fell in Nineveh, people started getting saved right and left. I believe that's the type of anointing that we're going to step into, is that anointing of vast salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. If you believe that, say amen. amen. I'm not quitting. I don't know when Jesus is coming back, and neither do you. But I don't think it's between now and the election. I think that we have the future of our nation is really in the hands of the remnant church. Will they come together? Will they pray and believe? Will they bind it loose? Will they quit being angry and start being effective? Let me say that one more time. Will they quit being angry and start being effective? That's what God's calling us to do. Amen. We have, we're about to have dinner in here to celebrate the lives of a bunch of children in this church. What are they going to inherit if we won't pray? I think there's, there's some chance that, I think there's a real good chance. I'm already seeing the, seeing the tide start to turn. I'm already starting to see people reach out. I'm already seeing young men, especially that have never heard the name of Jesus know that the way they're living is not right. They're dying emotionally. I'm starting to see that. So I'm not discouraged. I'm encouraged. And God is sending us a sign. What is he saying? Get to work. What was the word that we received when the, back in 2016 about the great shaking that was coming? He said, I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken. And he did. And we, in 2020, I couldn't imagine what that was. In 2020, I figured out. But he says in that same passage, he says, remember, I brought you out of Egypt and my spirit still abides in you. Now get to work. What work is he asking us to do? To intercede for the nation. Amen.